Hello, hello, and welcome back to Kelly's Take Two Pre-Licensing Review. So glad to have you with me again today. We are about to tackle one of the most important units in the entire book, Unit 7 on Agency. Agency is really the cornerstone of pre-licensing in North Carolina. It makes us very unique compared to other states uh, throughout the country. Some states in the country practice something called transactional brokerage, and I'll get in in just a few minutes into what the difference is between the two, but let's go. North Carolina practices common law of agency. That means when you are participating in a real estate transaction as a real estate broker, you have to represent somebody. You have to be on somebody's team. You could be on the team of a buyer. You could be on the team of a seller. You could be on the team of both a buyer and a seller. We'll dive into each of those types of relationships coming up throughout this review video. Now, if you live in another state or you are accustomed to real estate brokerage in another state, some states practice transactional brokerage where the agent is simply a facilitator, someone that's delivering paperwork from one side to the other. They are not representing, they're not standing in for a principal or a client like we do here in North Carolina. We are considered in North Carolina a fiduciary. We are going to enter into a trust-based relationship with either a buyer or a seller. And what does that mean exactly? Well, as a fiduciary, we owe certain lawful duties to our principal. The term principal and client can be used interchangeably. The acronym I choose to utilize to remember what those fiduciary duties are, those lawful duties, is the acronym LOADS. So if you wanna take a minute now and write the word LOADS vertically, then I'll tell you what each one of the letters means, or maybe you can beat me to it since this is a review and you've probably already gone through this material at least once. The L in LOADS stands for loyalty. We are to put the needs and the interests of our client, our principal, before our own. That means that we have to disclose any potential conflicts to our principal. We have to ensure that they are getting the highest level of service possible. We will make sure that we're not experiencing any type of a, a conflict of interest or we're self-dealing in some way, meaning that the transaction is going to turn out better for us than it would be for our client. Part of loyalty is also this word confidentiality. That's a big deal. We are charged with keeping all of our clients' information completely confidential. We cannot do, say, insinuate anything that could possibly harm our client's negotiating position, our client's interest. Moving on from loyalty, we've got the O standing for obedience. Yes, we are to follow the lawful instructions of our client. We are to obey the lawful instructions of our clients. That seems very interesting, doesn't it? We may have just met this particular individual and now if they choose to hire us, we must obey their lawful instructions. I like to joke that, oh my gosh, I took the word obey out of my wedding vows, but here I am in real estate in North Carolina needing to obey my client. The A in the acronym LOAD stands for accounting. We are to make sure that we are keeping track of all of the records associated with the transaction, along with making certain that if our client has placed mm, earnest money into the firm's trust account, that we are making sure that money is well taken care of, it's in good hands, we also have to follow various rules regarding records, how long we keep our records. And in North Carolina, the records, the North Carolina retention of records rule 
is for three years past final action. And we'll define final action coming up here in just a minute as well. The D in load stands for discovery and disclosure of material facts. A material fact is anything about the property that, or, the, well, actually in North Carolina, there are four categories of material facts. Well, what are they? Facts about the property would be number one. Things like that would be any issue with the property itself. Uh, does the property have uh, air conditioning? What kind of heating system does the property have? What type of driveway material is located on the property? Or is there a property defect that might influence a buyer's decision to move forward with the transaction? That could be possibly a crack in the foundation. That could be a leaky faucet, those sorts of things. We as agents, real estate brokers in North Carolina, are required to discover. So we're to look for some of these things that might stand out to us as being defective with the property that's slightly elevated than what a normal consumer or a consumer in general would be able to pick up on their own. Also, when it comes to, so that was category one, category two would be facts about the property. So what's going on around the property? Do we have zoning changes? Are we, what kind of zoning is the property located in in the first place? Um, what's our access to highways? Is there a factory that might be uh, being built or an apartment complex that may be built next to this property or vice versa? Is a factory closing? Mm, is a school closing? Those sorts of things. So facts about the property that relate to the property. Number three, the category number three when it comes to material facts would be mm, facts about the party's ability to close the transaction. So does the buyer have the financial wherewithal to actually close this transaction? And number two, for instance, does the seller have the means to sell the property or is there a cloud on title that we need to clear that cannot be cleared? Or is there um, a foreclosure proceeding that may be happening? So that's category three material fact. Category four material fact relates to anything that the client tells you is of importance to them now becomes a material fact for us or you the real estate broker representing them. Because again, if you live in a state that follows the practice or the common law of agency, you have to be representing someone and that will either be the buyer or the seller or sometimes both, and we'll get to that. Now let's hang out here for just a second and talk about the category four material fact, which means something that your client tells you of the, is of importance to them. Now that becomes material fact. That's going to relate directly to whether or not questions that your buyer, typically it's your buyer, may have about a property, whether or not what they're questioning should be considered a material fact or not. Well, like what, Kelly, you might be wondering. Well, let's say um, it's a crime scene. Unless you really have studied real estate and you have a real estate license, you may not know that at least in North Carolina, the fact that a crime, even a gruesome crime, even a murder or a suicide or something like that, that event happening in a house does not mean that it's a material fact that the listing agent needs to disclose. In fact, in North Carolina, the listing agent is not allowed to disclose that information without permission from the seller. So what does that mean? How does that impact a potential buyer? Well, occasionally you'll work with a buyer who might say to you, no, ooh, I really am uncomfortable living in a home or buying a home where somebody has died or there's been a crime of some sort. Okay, well, as the buyer's agent, the one representing the buyer, it is now on you to make certain that when you go to show properties, that those properties are cleared for not having a crime scene having been committed there. Now, like I said, it's a material fact for the agent representing that client who has the issue. It is not necessarily a material fact for the listing agent. 
the listing agent does not need to and, and is not allowed to disclose things like whether there's a death in the house, whether there was a crime scene, whether the property is um, located near where a sex offender may live or the homeowner is on the sex offender registry. That's related to Megan's law. Take a note of that. That's related to Megan's law. Um, the listing agent may not disclose ever if someone in the property has suffered from or died from HIV AIDS. That group is protected under federal fair housing under handicapping condition. So they're not allowed to discuss that. Again, the other issues that could create, watch this, a stigmatized property are not allowed to be disclosed by the listing agent unless the listing agent gives the, unless the seller gives the listing agent permission to do so. Before we leave the four categories of material facts, it's important to remember that in North Carolina, agents have the responsibility to discover and disclose material facts about the property. They must disclose this information to all parties, regardless of whose team they are or who they represent. What does that mean exactly? That means if I, Kelly Allen, am representing the seller and I find out that there is going to be a zoning change of some sort, I have to tell the buyer via the buyer's agent, listen, communication when it comes to a real estate transaction, we may say for the sake of time and efficiency that the seller communicates something to the buyer. Communication between the buyer and the seller, between the parties, the, between the parties of the contract happens between the agents who are working on behalf of those clients. We are the mouthpiece for our buyers, for our sellers. We follow their lawful instructions and follow their lawful orders and say what they would like us to say. Now, back to um, discovery and disclosure of material facts. We could get into a little bit of trouble if we neglect to share something that a reasonable agent would be deemed to have needing to discover or disclose. What kind of trouble could we get into? We could get in trouble for saying something incorrectly. That's called a misrepresentation. That can even be, when I say saying, I mean any kind of communication at all. That could be written communication, verbal communication. That would be called a misrepresentation. On the other side, if we fail to share information that a reasonable agent in our same shoes should be able to share, that's called an omission. You can dive into the weeds on this one and talk about willful versus negligent. That's not as testable as it used to be, but I will tell you that willful means the agent knew they did it and they knew they did something wrong at the exact time the event took place, whereas negligent means later on down the road, the agent said, mm, I, I just, I didn't even know that was a, a mistake that I made. Even if the mistake causes catastrophic harm, unless they knew at the very time that they committed that omission or misrepresentation, unless they knew at that very time that it was wrong, it's going to be considered negligent. All right, moving on from there, we're gonna go into the three classifications of agency. And there are three, one is universal, number two is general, and number three is special. Number one is the most broad. As a universal agent, you have the ability to stand in for another person, stand in for a client or a principal in all matters. Think of a power of attorney, that sort of thing. The number two is a general agent, and this individual has the ability to stand in for their principal to complete many different tasks. Think of this as somebody like a property manager. The homeowner has a, well, the agent has a fiduciary relationship with the property owner. As a property manager, that property manager is permitted to conduct many different tasks associated with their job. Another example of a general agent would be 
a sub agent working inside of a firm. So when we join a firm, we will be a sub agent of that firm, sub agent of the agent, it's a mouthful, isn't it? And as such, we will be standing in for our firm to complete many different tasks in the, in the role of representing sellers, in the role of representing buyers. Now, when we are hired really through our firm, and I'll get to that in a second, we are hired to do one special task. So when a buyer hires us, we are hired to specifically find them a house to purchase. When a seller hires us, they're hiring us to do one thing, that is to get their property sold. So when, when you're a special agent, you have the authority to help complete one task. And in real estate, that's going to be help a buyer get a property sold or conversely help a buyer find a property to purchase. It is important to remember that in North Carolina, the firm is considered to be the agent. And therefore all agents who are working inside of the firm are sub agents working on behalf of that firm. Just like what? One big happy family, or I like to joke around one big happy family. We might even have to sing a little sister sledge song here coming up here in a second. However, I want to make sure we get to the meat of this, which means what? Just like, at least I grew up this way. My mom said, don't go out airing your dirty laundry about this family out in the world. We had to keep what? All of our family information confidential inside the house. Same rule applies inside your firm. All of the agents are like one big firm elite, which means you should be able to share information about each other's clients with one another, knowing full well that every agent inside of that firm has the responsibility to keep that information confidential. How would that play out, Kelly, exactly? All right, well, let's say that uh, an agent in my firm comes busting in the door one day, yelling and so excited, they've got this brand new listing, and they need us to help get this listing sold because, ooh, their, their seller is desperate to sell. They have to move in three weeks to get their dream job in Alaska. Uh-oh, that's confidential information that if it were shared with a potential buyer could harm that seller's negotiating position. So what does that mean moving forward? Well, let's say another subagent inside of this firm works with a buyer who now wants to see and possibly purchase this house over here with the seller who's desperate to sell and move to Alaska. Well, this agent representing the buyer may not share that information with the buyer. Why? Because it would harm the seller. All agents are on the seller's team. All agents are on the buyer's team. Everybody is on each other's team inside the firm. That's called dual agency. And we are to protect the confidentiality of all parties. We may not harm nor help either side. And I'm going to review that for you again once we dive into agency options in North Carolina. So we just went over a universal agent, a general agent, a special agent. We reviewed the fact that in North Carolina, the firm is the agent and everyone working inside of the firm as licensees are sub-agents of the firm. Everybody by default is on the team of all of the clients that have been hired inside of that firm. In North Carolina, before a buyer or a seller decides that they want to hire us in order to represent them, we are required by law as licensees to review with that potential client how we can behave or act within a real estate transaction. We are to review agency and how it works with our potential clients. You see, people, in our world are gonna start out as consumers 
then as we start having discussions with them and maybe the, the conversation starts to take a more personal tone, we're going to pause, excuse ourselves for interrupting and say, hey, by law, I need, before we continue this fabulous conversation, I need to review with you how agency works here in North Carolina. The reason being is that not all states practice agency, first of all, and since we do practice agency, it's really important that the consumer understands how it works and whether or not they want representation from us as licensees. So what we're gonna do is go over the disclosure form. It used to be a brochure, but just recently they changed the brochure to just a very, very straightforward two-sided, one-page, two-sided form that we're going to share with our potential client. We hope they're going to turn into a client. And there are some rules about that. So we're going to go over the rules for the disclosure form right now. The biggest rule for going over agency disclosure, the agency disclosure form is the deadline. What do you mean? There's a deadline for going over the form? Yes. In North Carolina, there is a deadline when it comes to reviewing agency and the agency disclosure form with consumers, who of course we hope will turn into clients. That terminology is called first substantial contact. First substantial contact is when the conversation starts to get personal and when what? We start to focus, get it, the binoculars focus, focus on the needs and desires of the consumer. Now it has to go beyond just the basics. It has to go beyond just, I would really like a three bedroom, two bath house. It's gotta be a little more than that. So it may be, I really need a three bedroom, two bath house because blah, 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 blah. It's the blah, blah, blah that's gonna trigger the first substantial contact when they start or we start focusing on their needs. Another way to remember for substantial contact is m and &M. I got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. Not that m and &M, I mean money and motivation. So if they start talking to you about financial needs or anything that smells like motivation, you gotta what? Stop in the name of disclosure before you break the law. Think it over, do, do. So you gotta stop, you gotta interrupt. It might feel awkward and that's okay. That's okay, but by law, and that's what you say. Ooh, this is such a great conversation. I love having this talk with you. However, I'm gonna have to pause this just for a second because the, the tone of our conversation is getting a little personal and I wanna make sure that I go over how I can act in a real estate transaction in North Carolina. And then you launch into it, you launch into it and you say, I'm required by law to review agency with you. Remember, anytime something is uncomfortable or strange, what do you do? You blame it on your boss. And in this case, it would be the law, blame it on the real estate commission. You need to go over this with your potential client. You hope they will be your client. So that's first substantial contact. Going over the disclosure form is required in all sales transactions, commercial and residential, not in property management. You will go over the disclosure with them, letting them know it's a piece of consumer protection information. It is not a contract. And yet you need to prove to the real estate commission, should you be audited one day, you need to prove to them that you've gone over this. And would you please, Mr., Mrs., Ms. Consumer, would you please sign to acknowledge that I did review this information with you? What if they refuse? Well, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, okay? So you can't make them, can't force their hand to sign the ding dang thing. So what you need to do is simply make note that they refuse to sign and date and initial it and keep it in your file. The consumer gets a copy of the disclosure form and you keep one for your file as well. 
Well, speaking of that, Kelly, how long are we to keep our files? Three years, three years, three years from final action. What is final action? Well, it depends. Final action, if the individual turns into a client, right, and you're helping them buy a home, sell a home, then final action is either the closing of the transaction, so all the documents have been recorded at the Register of Deeds office, or money that's sitting in a trust account that the firm has, that money is released. That would be final action. Conversely, if the individual, the consumer does not turn into a client, then final action would be um, maybe, or if they are a client and it dissolves for some reason or it expires, so it could be expiration of agency, it could be mutual agreement to part ways, some such thing like that. Once you've completed reviewing the agency disclosure form, which is just a bit of consumer protection education, essentially, then it's important to follow that up with a question in terms of how does this person want to be represented or do they not want to be represented? So the way I would, I always say that to my potential clients is I go over the brochure and then I say, hey, Katrina, now that you've heard how agency works here in North Carolina, are you interested in having someone like myself represent you in a real estate transaction? It could be for the next few months while we're looking for properties. It could even be just for today. It could even Katrina simply be for, be for the one or two homes that we're gonna look at this afternoon. But are you interested in having someone like me stand in for you, look out for your best interests, hold all of your information confidential, help you through the process A to Z, and just represent you in the best way? She's going to say, of course, Kelly, because you're amazing. I'm going to say, great. Well, would now watch this, y'all. In North Carolina, Katrina is a buyer. In North Carolina, I can have an oral or verbal buyer agency agreement with Katrina, or we could go ahead and get it in writing. You and I know that in writing is the best, and yet I still need to cover with you your options and what's legal in North Carolina. And it is legal to have a buyer agency agreement that is verbal to start. It's still going to be considered an express agreement. An express verbal agreement? What does that mean? Express means expression in real estate school. So you can express things verbally. You can also express things in writing. So if Katrina says, Kelly, I'm just not real comfortable um, putting a, con a buyer agency contract together right now, I might at my discretion, at my discretion say, that's fine. Let's work together today with a verbal buyer agency agreement. So I'm going to stand in for you. So see, I'm going to take on all this risk, right? And I want you to know, Katrina, that in North Carolina, a verbal buyer agency agreement must be non-exclusive. So you're free to work with all other agents in the city. Yes, I promise you, you're supposed to say that, or the county. And on top of that, Katrina, there's no um, set date for that. I, it's not going to like... We don't have to put our agreement in writing, you know, like the three days from now or anything like that. We do, however, Katrina, according to the North Carolina Real Estate Commission and license law, their rules and license law, we do have to let the Real Estate Commission know the nature of our relationship prior to putting together an offer. So we have to, this is how I teach my students to remember this, we have to reduce our verbal our agency agreement, we have to reduce it to writing prior to presentation of offer. And then watch this, y'all, this little inside tip and trick. Okay, watch it. You're, you're probably not going to copy me, but I'll just fill you in. I would say like this, Katrina, here's the deal. The market is so fast right now. I mean, when you find what you want, we've got to make a move, right? And we're so focused on that that I hate to say it, but I would hate to forget 
through this fake blonde hair. It's gray underneath there. I'm getting old, Katrina. There's only so much bandwidth I've got. I would hate to forget to circle back and put that buyer agency agreement together in writing. So if you wouldn't mind, I say we review it now and just knock it out. What do you think? There you go. Okay, that was a good life lesson. Back to testable information. So testable information, your buyer agency agreement could be verbal to start with as long as you reduce it to writing prior to presentation of offer. Really anything that's verbal, this is just a nice rule. Anything that's verbal needs to what? Be reduced to writing prior to presentation of offer. All right, so you could um, decide right then if someone is going to be, if you're gonna represent them or not. Now, when it comes to working with everybody else, uh, sellers, property owners, all agency agreements have to be in writing according to North Carolina license law. It's just a matter of when. And that one little, that one little buyer agency agreement, that's the, that's the oddball out there. That's the anomaly. But it also must be in writing when prior to presentation of offer. So you could be hired by a buyer. You could be hired by a seller. Now, when you're uh, going to be working with a seller, that agreement has to be in writing from the very beginning. Why? You need permission from the seller to advertise the property. Even placing the property in the multiple listing service is considered advertising. So you have to have a listing agreement with that seller right out of the gate. And we'll go over agency contracts, agency agreements in the next unit, unit eight. So you can work with a buyer. You can work with a seller. There's a pretty good chance you may work with both or inside of your firm, you may end up working with both. So dual agency is what we call that. Dual agency could be one agent. I, Kelly Allen, have the listing and I, Kelly Allen, found the buyer. Maybe it's at an open house or some such thing. That could be, that would render me in a dual agency position. More common than that, like I could count how many times that happened with me on one hand. Seems exciting. It's really ooh, 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 a little tricky. But more common is when you have two different agents inside of a firm representing a buyer, representing a seller. The firm remains the agent, the firm has to be neutral. All agents have to be neutral in dual agency. We can't help one side or the other. Why? Because we're like one big family. Hey, 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 now I got all my agents with me. That's right. So we're all on each other's teams. We're all aunts, uncles, cousins, la, la, la. We're all one big family. Even if I don't even know so-and-so seller, and so-and-so doesn't even know my buyer. It doesn't matter because North Carolina is considered the firm. And as such, all business technically belongs to the firm. We have been given the authority via the firm to work with buyers and to work with sellers. So what does that do? Does that get tricky? It sure does. The Real Estate Commission will tell you that just like having little twins, just like these guys right here, just like having some babies and look out for this baby's got a little crazy eye. Well, so good. We'll get you to the eye doctor, sweetie. Okay, just like having twin little babies right here, it is difficult to advance the needs of both the buyer and the seller in a dual agency situation. It is difficult to do that with your twin babies. I can't feed them both at the same time. I can't change both diapers at the same time and whatnot. It's tricky. So in dual agency, uh, you have to treat both parties honestly and fairly, but you may, not, you may not advocate for them or advise them any longer. So if this baby wants to make an offer on this baby's house and this baby says, Kelly, what price should I offer? My answer is, baby, what price do you wanna offer? And over here, this baby says, Kelly, how should I counter that offer? I say, 
baby, how do you want to counter that offer? You know what I mean? So I can't help either side. I can't harm either side either. Now in North Carolina, there are many agents who, woo, they do, they are in their feelings. They are in their feelings about dual agency. They don't like it. So years ago, North Carolina created, this is North Carolina specific, North Carolina created a solution for dual agency. It's called designated agency. This is a good time to write some notes down. Designated agency is an optional form of dual agency. If you have a question on the exam related to designated agency, it will clearly state, and the agents are acting as designated agents. So be careful. Don't assume things. Don't read things into questions. As soon as you start to say to yourself, but what if, or if the question said it this way, mm -mm -mm, stop, you will miss it. So be careful. Read carefully. So the Real Estate Commission came up with a solution for the problem or the challenge of dual agency called designated agency. Designated agency, again, is an optional form of dual agency. Firms do not have to practice it. They may not want to offer it. Why? Because it's, there's a bit of liability that's involved in it. Because even in designated agency, the firm still has to remain neutral. How neutral, Kelly? I'm talking neutral like Switzerland people, I'm talking that kind of neutral. Exactly. All right, so what did they do? They said, the commission said, oh yeah, that is tricky, isn't it? Hmm. Well, here's what we're gonna do. We are going to, he said, we are going to allow agents inside of a firm the firm that chooses to practice designated agency to once again be granted the ability to fully represent their buyer or their seller. Now, of course, it has to be two different people. So you can't have single agent designated agency. You've got to have two separate agents for this one. One that's going to represent the buyer, one that's going to represent the seller couple of things. So you have to have an office policy to practice designated dual agency. And you may never have the broker in charge be designated against a provisional broker. Why? Because the broker in charge is supervising the provisional broker and surely confidential information would be shared. All right. So before we get are allowed to practice designated agency, the individual deemed to be the designator, typically the broker in charge, uh, will ask of each agent, hey, do you know any confidential information about the other side right now? Like right now, right now? No, I don't know a thing. Okay, sit tight for a minute. Hey, do you know any confidential information about the other side? Like right now, like right now, right now? No, I don't know a thing at all. Oh, okay. So they don't know any confidential information about each other currently, and we do practice and we have an office policy and uh, neither one is, we're not going to have a BIC going up against a provisional broker. This one could be a provisional broker. This one could be a broker. That's fine. You just cannot ever have a BIC against a provisional. So the designator is going to say, by the powers vested in me. Because you have an office policy and because there is no current confidential information known about either side, I can magically restore your fiduciary duties. You may now fully represent your buyer. You may now fully represent your seller. You are designated agents. The firm though remains what? Neutral. And it's this part, the firm remaining neutral. When the firm has to remain neutral, the firm has to ensure that both parties' information is kept confidential and there's not any harm to either side. That's the sticky wicket that keeps a lot of firms from practicing designated agency is the fear that what? Loose lips moving forward will sink ships. To wrap things up, let's talk about how an agency relationship may be terminated. An agency relationship may be terminated via a number of ways. One would be that you get the job done. You complete your task 
or you get her done, right? That's one way. Number next is if the property is destroyed, that will terminate your agency relationship. Expiration of your agency agreement will terminate that. Mutual agreement to part ways. Breach of contract by one or the other parties by court order or operation of law, that will terminate your agency relationship. So any of those, and then death, but let's talk about death. It's only death of the buyer or the seller, death of the client. Death of the sub-agent or the agent working within the firm. Now we're calling that person an affiliate, by the way. I like that, an affiliate. Death of the affiliated broker. Let's just extend that for a second while we get used to that terminology. Death of the affiliated broker doesn't mean a thing, y'all. Doesn't mean a hill of beans, nothing. It does not. You know, everyone's going to cry one tear and move along. That client will be assigned to another affiliate, affiliated agent inside of the firm. And uh, they just keep trucking. It would have to be death of the firm to end that agency relationship by the firm going out of business or some such thing. I hope this has been a helpful review for you. Remember to subscribe. We appreciate that. And come on back and we'll keep moving toward getting through that licensing exam. Keep up the good work.